So I don't know about you, but I have made some terrible decisions in business and probably have made some bad decisions in my life. But this framework, after I learned this, really helped me to get more clear on making better decisions and certainly looking back on it now, 15 years ago after I've learned this strategy has helped me make way better decisions, whether that be in business or in life. And I'm going to share it with you. And so early in my career, I was mentored by a billionaire. It all starts off with a story that he told me that really frames up this decision-making framework so well. And so the story goes like this. A thousand years ago in an old village in India, one of the biggest challenges this village had was that King Cobra snakes were killing small children. And so the town hall gets together and they're all kind of thinking about, okay, how do we solve this issue? What can we do that will eliminate this massive problem? I mean, these damn snakes are killing our children and these young babies. And so they had an idea. One of the, one of the town member halls says, well, what if we, what if we created a, a situation or an incentive rather for people in the village to, to help us to kill these snakes. And if they kill these snakes and they bring them into town hall, we will pay them for every snake that they kill. And so we're kind of setting up a win-win situation for the city. We have our biggest problem. We, we, we uh, create a world where everybody in the town or in the city can contribute to helping this solve this massive, massive issue. And so we start to kill off the snakes and they get paid for it. So you have everybody on the same page. And so for a while, it really, really helped. A lot of the snakes, people were bringing bags and bags and bags of snakes to town hall, killing off all the snakes. They were getting money for doing so. Babies st uh, stopped dying. It was all good for a while. However, this is where, this is what they did, didn't think about. They later called this the cobra effect. Because that was working so well, what ended up happening is one of the people in the town created a snake farm. He said to them, he said to himself, he said, well, if, if I'm going to get paid for killing off these snakes, well, what if I create a snake farm and I have an endless supply of snakes and I can just go out into my farm and essentially mate these snakes so I can have as many snakes as I want. And that's exactly what he did. And so not only did he get rich and wealthy off of his snake farm because he had the most snakes he was bringing to town hall and town hall was like, wow, keep doing this, keep doing this, keep doing this. You're really helping us. Well, what, what was happening is a lot of those snakes from the snake farm escaped out of the farm and they started killing the small children yet again, started killing the babies yet again. And so now the town hall found themselves in a worse off situation than their original problem where they had more snakes killing more children and they were depleting their funds because they were paying so many people for bringing in these bags of snakes, specifically the snake farmer. And the whole point of the story was they didn't have the framework that I'm going to share with you guys today around decision making. They only thought through what we call first order consequences. They didn't think through second order consequences, which we're going to break down in just a second. And so they said, wow, this is a great idea. And then they went all in on that decision. Lo and behold, that backfired. That decision backfired. So to make sure that Cobra effect doesn't happen to you and your life and your business, let me share with you what I was taught. So when we go, when, when we think about making a decision, and I'm going to make this very practical for you, and most of you are real estate agents that watch the channel, so this will make a lot of sense to you. So when we think about making a, a decision, what we have to do is there's two parts to this. 
we have to have an argument for the what we believe to be a good idea. And that has to be strong. And that's probably the easy part for most of you. I mean, when you have a new idea, and most of us struggle with shiny object, it's easy to sell ourselves on that idea. It's easy to sell others on that idea because you have such a bias towards wanting to do that thing that most of the time we only think about the upside of doing that, right? So that's one part. You have to have an argument against, or I'm sorry, an argument for the idea. And then the, the second side is an argument against it. And both arguments must be presented with, with well thought out upsides and downsides, I'll call them, right? So when you're making an argument for an idea, what, what is the upside to the idea, right? What is the downside to the idea? Then what is the argument against not doing the thing? And what is the upside to not doing it? And what is the downside for not doing it? And so the first part of your or of the decision making framework that most billionaires um, use that 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 I was taught was okay you have options right and so instead of really focusing on okay I'm gonna make this decision quickly off of emotion let me first look at okay what is the argument for what is the argument against that's part one. Okay, I've got the I've got the counter arguments. I have to argue against this thing as much as I'm arguing for it. And sometimes just through part one, you might find, well, damn, um, I didn't think about all the things I just came up with when I went through the exercise of arguing against it. I'm out. You may find that to be the case. And then step two is once you have the argument for and the argument against, then we say, okay, what are the upsides and downsides? for moving forward with that decision and doing that decision. What are the upsides to it? What are the downsides to doing it? And then the same thing for for against. What are the upsides to not doing it? And what are the downsides for not doing it? All right, so so that's the the two-part framework. Now, let me give you an example because really what we're talking about is something called second-order consequences. So when you make the decision, whether you decide to do something or not do something, what we have to do is think through what would happen next. So after you've come to what you believe to be a conclusion to say, okay, I've made my decision based on this new framework. I've made an argument for, I made an argument against. I have looked at the upsides and downsides of each of doing it or not doing it. What are the second order consequences? Now that I've made the decision, what do things look like? So let me give you an example. This is one that I use often because I think you'll it'll make sense. Let's look at the decision for a real estate agent like yourself to buying Zillow leads as an example, all right? So you say to yourself, well, man, I'm really struggling for business or my business is inconsistent or my income is inconsistent and you know, buying Zillow leads from arguably the biggest lead generation company in our industry, well, that sounds like a good idea. Like I've got some of these funds and I'm gonna go buy these leads and hopefully that all my problems go away because I'll now have uh, some, some consistent lead flow. So you start making that argument for buying the Zillow leads. Now, that's easy. I mean, that's what most of us do. That's why most of us are plagued by shiny object syndrome. It's we see something or we hear something that may be working for somebody else and we look at our current situation and what's not working and it's easy to say, well, I'm going to go try that other thing. So we go through part one of the decision-making framework, but we're, we're looking for the Cobra effect constantly. So we make the argument for, all right, the argument for to buy Zillow leads is, well, I got consistent lead flow and um, because I have consistent lead flow, that my thought is I'll have consistent closings, I'll have consistent income, and my money problems will go away. That is the argument for. Well, the argument against that is, well, it's very expensive. I might not convert all of them. And my argument for against is I know myself and 
I know my follow-up systems aren't that organized. I know I tend to, you know, um, jump from one thing to the next. So it might be, might be a huge waste of time. And so that's part one. Then we get into part two. What are the ups and downs to doing it or to not doing it? Well, if I do it, if I make this decision, okay, some of the upsides are, well, I've got leads, but the downside to me doing it, okay, so you made the decision to do it. The downside to doing it is the second order consequence. So now that I've made the decision to buy Zillow leads, we have to think about ahead of time, what are the downsides to doing it? The downsides might be, well, now you're chasing buyers around all over town. Which means, so what is the second order consequence to that? That means you now no longer have maybe enough time to prospect for what I think you want, which is listings, okay? Because what happens to a lot of agents when they start buying internet leads is they start running all over town showing all of these buyers' houses because they are trying to make that investment, that decision work. Because if you go back, they sold themselves on doing this. They sold everybody else. They sold them their spouse. They sold their broker. They sold their business partner on, this is what we got to do. This is what we got to do. So now they're in a position where they've got to prove that that investment was worth it. And so you have to think about, okay, well, what is the downside of that? What, what am I, if I do go and buy Zillow leads, it's going to take a lot of time away. It's gonna, I'm going to spend a lot of money. I won't have time to prospect the way that I want to go and, and find sellers. Well, that's the downside of doing it. So then we do the same thing on the opposite. If I don't do it, what are the upsides? What are the upsides to me not buying Zillow leads? Well, the upside is I save a lot of money. The upside is I might save myself a lot of time. And therefore, I might have that time to focus on listings. Hmm, interesting. The money I save from not buying leads, maybe I can use that money to potentially hire, I don't know, a part-time ISA to find me listings. I'm just giving you an example. Well, then you have to do the same thing. You can't be biased towards one way or the other. And I'm trying to be fair in this video too. I'm going to try not to be biased towards listings. Very difficult for me to do. Well, what are the downsides to not doing it? So if I don't buy the Zillow leads, what are the downsides? The downsides is, yeah, I might have all this time and, and more money, but will I utilize that? Will I, will I use the time to my advantage and actually prospect and pick up the phone, which I know I'm very inconsistent doing, will I use that time to look for new clients? I don't know. I don't know. I haven't proven to myself that I've been able to do that so far. So I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. What about the money I'm saving? If I don't do it, the downside is do I use the money that I would be spending on Zillow leads for anything or would I just blow it? And you go through this entire process and you could do this with anything. I'm just giving you Zillow leads as an example. You could do this with everything. And for me, it has made my decision making so much better and help me to remove from the emotion because my younger self would would be so good at convincing myself to jump into things quickly without truly thinking them through the way that I'm outlining in today's video and I'd find myself regretting a lot of the decisions that I would make I'm like why why did I here I am again. Why did I do this again? And then I found myself bouncing from one thing to the next, one thing to the next, because I didn't do the work up front in, in this decision-making process the way that I've outlined, and I was just quick to operate from emotion. So to recap, let's make sure you got this, all right? So we have a decision. you got to fight the bias towards just jumping in emotionally. Ah, oh, I want to do this thing. All right, cool. Well, let's just look at that one more time. What are, what's the argument for doing it? What's the argument for not doing it? Step one. Step two, once I have those arguments, what is the upside to doing it? What is the downside to, to, to doing it? What are the upsides to not doing it? What are the downsides to, to not doing it? 
And then once you go through that process, we're looking at second order consequences of once I've made that decision, are there any COBRA effects? Are there any things, unintentional consequences that I haven't thought about that will be a byproduct of me making this decision? And think about that story of the cobra in the village because this is what comes back to bite people all the time. They're not thinking about the second order consequences. They're not thinking about the cobra effect. 